When we hear, we either accept or reject, or we translate what we hear according to our knowledge, our background, or we compare what is being said to what is already known. We oppose one idea by another. All these characteristics of hearing denies the act of listening. When one listens, there is no comparison, there is no acceptance or rejection. That very act of listening brings about a total attention in which you see the totality and the full significance and structure of what is being said. The quality of listening is attention. And when you attend totally with your whole mind, with your heart, with your nerves, with your eyes and ears completely, intensely listen. When you give your whole attention to something, that is when you are completely listening. In that state of attention, there is the act of listening. And that act of listening puts away anything that is not true. You Listen to the totality of the thing. When you attend, there is no borders of inattention. And that act of listening is a really a miracle. Perhaps it's the greatest miracle. When one can listen totally, without any defense, without any barrier, then one can look, then one can listen. Look, sir, if I want to understand what you are saying, I must listen to you. I must listen to you with affection, with care, with attention. Because I want to find out what you are saying. But if I say, yes, I agree with you, I've heard this before, or you're saying something new which is impossible, you're not listening. One of the most intriguing discoveries in modern science is the fact that there is nothing in this world that even approaches what might be called truly solid. We speak of solids, liquids, and gases, but these terms describe superficial rather than basic properties of matter. All matter, regardless of its state, is composed of invisible particles called atoms, which in turn are composed of other particles. The air we breathe, though invisible to us, is just as real as wood, or metal, because it's made of the same fundamental particles. It is the arrangement of these particles and the forces that bind them together that give to a substance its special properties. If we bring a piece of steel close to a magnet, we say that the steel becomes magnetized. But what is it that actually happens? If we place the steel inside a coil of wire connected to a high-gain amplifier, and then bring the magnet close to the bar of steel, we can hear something that suggests movement inside the steel. Listen. We think of a piece of steel as being solid, and according to our definition, it is a solid. But the popular concept of what makes a solid is certainly a false one. 
this piece of steel and any so-called solid substance on this earth is almost entirely empty space. If we could eliminate the empty space in this piece of steel, all that would remain would be a tiny bit of matter so small as to be invisible even with a high power microscope. This concept of almost unlimited empty space within matter is comparatively new, but it is the very cornerstone of our knowledge in this atomic age. Atoms are not solid. Instead, they are tiny solar systems composed of infinitely small particles revolving at tremendous speeds and bound together by enormous forces. And like our solar system, atoms are almost entirely empty space. For the moment, let's forget the forces within the atom. Thinking only of the particles and the empty space around them, science knows no reason why I couldn't take this so-called solid steel bottle and just throw it right on through that wall. Except this, we've tried it and it hasn't worked. If I were to attempt to run through that wall right now, all I'd get for my trouble would be a good-sized lump on the head. But that which would prevent my body passing through the wall would not be a collision of particles, but rather a collision of forces. The same forces that make an atom bomb. And if it were not for these forces, my body could go freely back and forth through that wall just as though it were not there. It is within the realm of scientific possibility that there could be two worlds coexistent, occupying the same part of space at the same moment of time, each world just as real as the other, with its mountains, valleys, rivers, trees, and people, and that one world could pass freely through the other world, neither world being conscious of the existence of the other world, if you grant just one thing, Atomic forces within the material substance of these two worlds that are not mutually interactive. What do we mean by this? Let's see. Here are two pieces of steel. Their appearance is quite similar. But a magnet will reveal a basic internal difference between the two pieces. This one, of course, is picked up. But uh, this one is unaffected. This piece of steel is non-magnetic, stainless steel. Of course, we all know that other metals, such as brass or aluminum, are not affected by the magnet. But a ring made of aluminum is something else. It can be suspended in air by the electromagnetic force of what is actually a transformer. The ring being in effect a one turn shorted secondary. A smaller ring will react even more violently. Here is another ring. This one made of a material we say is non conductive. And it is completely unaffected. Here is another example. Several thousand watts of pop were involved in that spark. If we replace the spark gap with a copper coil, the same power now flows through the coil. It's invisible, has no effect on many substances, but it can generate a lot of heat. Wood, paper, things that we think of as being quite inflammable are not affected at all. However, a piece of steel wool bursts into flame instantly. Did you ever fry an egg on a cold stove? It's no trick at all if you have the right equipment. This is a cold hot plate. And because it's cold, you can make it out of wood, if you like. Just be sure that there's a coil of wire inside and that you connect that coil to a high voltage alternating current source. The rest is easy. As long as we're being different, we'll use motor oil instead of Crisco. The egg fries very quickly. 
but the stove remains perfectly cold. In fact, if you wish, just to keep it handy, you can fry your egg on the morning newspaper. With a gadget like this, you can get up in the morning, sit on the stove, read the morning newspaper, and fry the eggs in your lap. Another example of the fact that physical forces can be quite selective in their effect. All of the examples which we have cited thus far have been in the physical realm, and of course have been limited by that fact. We can, however, cite examples that transcend the purely physical and clearly demonstrate the reality of these two worlds. the quantum unit, if you like, the real basis basics of the universe, quantum physics thinks are a quark, okay? Right. A quark, a single unit, a single nothing. A quark is made up of two units which vibrate. Yes. Okay, think mm -hmm. of our light and our sound that we were talking about earlier on, okay? But because they vibrate, they are pure energy, pure frequency. Right. But they give the impression of being matter by creating the vibration which creates a physical response. As you know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical languages. That when we go to understand physical phenomena, we generally find that there's some sort of mathematical underpinning to whatever the phenomena is. You know, like the Fibonacci sequence? That's like that series you find in nature? Like the face of a sunflower? Wherever the spirals. You see this math everywhere. How did we end up in a universe like that? Why should the world behave according to mathematical laws? And it turns out, in fact, all of our senses appear to rely on sort of Fourier transforms, that they all seem to use the same mathematics. So again, here's evidence that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher the sensory world as are involved in the making of a hologram, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, not proof, but compelling evidence that something is going on there. It is not only that it becomes easier to describe with mathematics. As you go deeper and deeper into reality, mathematics becomes the only way to describe reality. Okay, so one, one, two, three, five, that's the beginning of the Fibonacci sequence. Next number in the sequence, what do you think? How about eight? The number after that, 13. The number after that, 21. So if you're getting those right along with me, then you've recognized the pattern that I wrote with the first few numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, which is this. It starts with a one, the next number is a one, then after that, to get the next number, you'll always add the two numbers that came before that. So one and one is two, one and two is three, two and three is five, three and five is eight, so on and so forth. So that's, the, that's recognizing the pattern that exists in the Fibonacci sequence. So it turns out that this sequence of numbers has all kinds of applications. It describes all kinds of things in the world that we see around us. There's a conspiracy to hide this information that DNA is a Fibonacci, is an exemplification of this number called, or entity uh, ratio sequence called the uh, golden ratio. The ratio that proves the existence of intelligent design, or the uh, reality of intelligent design of the cosmos. I mean, if you go to the golden ratio 
site for Wikipedia too on the same theme. Um, <laughs> they don't mention any of this stuff in nature that we're going to talk about here that we talked about on the show two days ago and that we're talking about here. They talk about how it's found in architecture and math and all this kind of stuff. They don't discuss it how it's found in the measurements of the human arm. Why not? It's just, it's, it, I mean, well, I think I'm making, that's the point here. I think that just made sense to me, thinking this through as I say it to you. It has to be a conspiracy. How could all of this be overlooked, and how could Wikipedia leave it out? It's, it can't be, it has to be somehow that big money has pushed their influence uh, somehow, and they've had a drive to keep this covered up or something. These can't all be coincidences. And since they're doing that with everything else, it has to be the case that uh, there's some movement to keep this stifled. I mean, why isn't in, here's another piece to add to this. Why isn't it, this in our education system? We learn all this junk geometry, pea brain stuff when you take geometry in high school, and they don't teach you about any of this? The golden ratio everywhere in nature? I, I went through ed, elementary school... You know, high school, college, uh, you know, undergrad degree in college, uh, master's degree, and halfway through PhD, and never was this, any of this mentioned. It, and we know who controls the universities, uh, the big money behind it, all the way up to the Illuminati Nephilim uh, controllers. So this can't be. This is planned, okay? And you just wonder. It's got. I mean, I'm almost concluding here in my mind. This Davidson college sites showing up number one in Google all the time and the first page and Wikipedia having the strange measurements which don't correlate with all kinds of these examples from academic sites I'm finding I'm putting them all pictures of the uh, screenshots in the newsletter um, it's got to be a conspiracy I mean we could keep going compiling the evidence it would just all lead to it so and that and if we could keep compiling evidence of it being a conspiracy I mean, everything points towards it. I'm just throwing ideas off the top of my head. These strange sites show up at the top. Wikipedia is wrong. It's covered up completely in, in the best-selling books about the Golden Ratio, which come from uh, wealthy university professors. It's uh, the universities and the education, government-controlled education system absolutely covers it up. You see how, I mean, everything's falling in the same direction. You know, the, so when everything, uh, all these conclusions point to the same direction, that it's covered up and hidden.
mean, this is pretty powerful stuff that we're going over. I mean, there's no anthropologist or biologist on the planet who can explain this one. How how the sunflower evolved a bunch of spirals in it. It's, a, it's seed pod design. And how those spirals exactly lead to a golden ratio Fibonacci series numbers. Unbelievable. Okay, this is it. There's no question. I mean, we've all been lied to all through our undergraduate college degrees and our elementary schools and on our TVs just by them not discussing all this. I mean, you know how many how examples I have here? There's so many and they're all this powerful. Okay? And all this was hidden from us while we were in our schools learning about what were we learning about? Um, plate tectonics theory. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty sad. Pretty sad case. And when it's so obvious everywhere in nature it has to be a conspiracy in the uh, satanic new world order Illuminati system we live in they don't want I guess they don't want you to know this stuff because you might realize that this reality you live in is charged with the with the uh, with with Yahweh the architects fingerprint is absolutely everywhere and it's in you 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 are a piece of that fingerprint and hey, you might realize that your consciousness is also, and that there's no joke in saying you're created in God's image, and you can therefore take part in the power and creation of the intelligent designer. The placebo effect is the extraordinary phenomena of people getting better even when they've only had a dummy treatment or a sham treatment. So that can mean uh, a sugar pill, but it can also mean sham ultrasound, where somebody just holds the machine up to your body but doesn't really switch it on. Or even a, a fake uh, operation, where somebody makes the incision and then pretends to do the operation but doesn't actually do anything. And the fascinating and amazing thing is, it turns out that when people get these fake sham treatments, they often get better. What's interesting about the placebo effect is it shows the amazing power of the mind over the body. When it comes to the origin of life, there are only two possibilities, creation or spontaneous generation. There is no third way. Spontaneous generation was disproved 100 years ago, but that leads us to only one other conclusion, that of supernatural creation. We cannot accept that on philosophical grounds, therefore we choose to believe the impossible that live, life arose spontaneously by chance." End quote. See what he's, what he's saying there is that science has to be conducted in a naturalistic vacuum. On philosophical grounds, we can't follow the evidence wherever it leads if it leads us outside the natural realm, to a metaphysical realm, to a supernatural realm. We have to stay within this naturalistic, materialistic box. This in 1954, and the idea here is that science will ultimately answer all of these questions, but the last thing that we want to do is jump into some kind of philosophical or theological explanation. It's interesting that 30 years later, in 1984, the late George Wald again gave us another quote. This was called Life and Mind in the Universe, and he actually was speaking at the Quantum Biology Symposium. And here's what he said 30 years after the quote I just read you. It has occurred to me lately, I must confess, with some shock at first to my scientific sensibilities, that both questions, meaning the origin of consciousness in humans and of life from non-living matter, might be brought into some degree of congruence. This is with the assumption that mind, rather than emerging as a late outgrowth in the evolution of life, has existed always as the matrix, the source and condition of physical reality. The stuff of which physical reality is composed is mind stuff. It is mind that has composed a physical universe that breeds life and so eventually evolves creatures that know and create science, art, and technology-making animals. In them, the universe begins to know itself. This again was 1984 by the late George Wald, an agnostic and materialist naturalist. But do you see where he's going there? He brings in a notion of mind. He says, as I studied these 30, these 30 years, these three decades since his previous statement, 
How does matter become mind? It doesn't. Mind must bring forth matter. You see, matter has never brought forth consciousness or rationality or mind. Information. See, now we know what the, the simple cell, so-called, or DNA, that this is information code. Information theory would say that this type of code, this type of ordered sequence, this type of information can only be a product of mind, of intelligence. There is no other alternative. So what is George Wald saying here, even though it shocks his scientific sensibilities? It's that in all areas of study, mind must bring forth information, matter, etc. Matter never brings forth mind. Think about that. The evidence to me that just cries out that there's a God is the study of DNA. DNA is a very powerful, massive information storage system. In fact, DNA that makes up our genes actually is like books of information that's read by a language system. It's absolutely phenomenal. And scientists know today that language as a code only come from an intelligence and information only comes from information. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to a code. Nobody's ever seen matter by itself give rise to information. And as you look at DNA, it actually cries out in the beginning, God created the universe. We all begin as a single cell the size of a period at the end of a sentence. How does that cell know how to build a, a body with 100 trillion uh, cells in it, thousands of different kinds, and each one of them is so complex, nanochemical machinery beyond our comprehension how it works, and encoded is the instruction manual. It's the manufacturer's manual how to build and operate every part of this incredible body made up of 100 trillion cells. Furthermore, DNA is a three-dimensional molecule that is self-replicating. Each molecule is able to make an identical copy quickly and efficiently. The Lord has even programmed DNA to detect and correct replication errors. These sophisticated capabilities far exceed man's means. God has created the DNA molecule in such a way that it is self-correcting. There are special proteins called enzymes that go up and down the DNA molecule looking for and making repairs on a minute-by-minute, second-by-second basis. God created us with a DNA code that actually has what we call editase or editorial type enzymes. Just as an editor reads a newspaper or a book looking for mistakes, so God has created special enzymes that go up and down our DNA molecule repairing the mistakes in ways that are unbelievably complex. Our DNA has information in it and there is a whole field of scientific study called information science which studies how information originates, how it's transmitted and so on. And one of the laws of information science says that information never originates by itself in matter, never spontaneously comes about. Anytime we trace uh, the copying of information back to its source, it always, it always comes back to a mind. And since we have creative information in DNA, that tells me that DNA comes from intelligence. It's not something that could possibly come about through millions of years of mutations and natural selection. Nobody knows. Go ask your, go to the university and go ask your physicists, go ask your chemists, go ask them and say this. Say, how do these crazy things called quantum particles, which act so strangely, compose the next stage up the chain? How, how do they compose an atom? And then ask, how does an atom compose a molecule? And how does a molecule compose a chemical? And they're going to say, we don't have any idea. Now they'll probably get out their their you know tinker toys and draw you or sculpt you a picture of an atom and say this is how the atom is structured and it gives rise to the molecule and some molecule in question. And you say no 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 professor, how does one compose the other? I didn't ask you to show me a representation that that you think is true about the one, and then just you know about the atom and then just say oh it composes the the uh, the next stage up the the molecule. I want you to say, Professor, I want you to show me how it works. Tell me what is involved. Get, guide me through the process. And that professor is going to say, 
we don't know how it works. We can't. So the point is here, I remember we studied this a lot when I was a graduate student in physics, or philosophy. We talked about this a lot. The, there is no known uh, relationship between quantum particles and then uh, the things that they allegedly compose, whether it's a mole molecules or chemicals or worlds or rocks or whatever. Now, there's a whole lot of people who are going to tell you that that's what happens, that the quantum particles compose physical reality. Now, um, <laughs> I'm not so sure. This is the level of knowledge, okay, not of uh, wishful thinking. Okay, the level of knowledge is when we have empirical data and philosophical reasoning that is that sophisticated, that powerful, that ironclad, that, that simple, that uh, we can say, okay, it can't be any other way. This, so we have to say, this is an absolute truth. This has to be a truth of things, and this can't be an illusion. So we know something. I mean, what what's more enjoyable than that? Well, I can think of a couple things that are more enjoyable, but that's that's pretty uh, for someone like me who's just obsessed with knowing how things are and and knowing about myself and just knowing the the way reality works. And I know a lot of the listeners of this show are the same way. Being able to exist at that level, that empirical and philosophical level is really important to me and it feels really really good okay some people don't care about stuff like this and that's fine just let them go and they care about other things you know, maybe they care about arts or maybe they care about television or maybe they like Barack Obama and, and war and maybe they like to be brainwashed or, or who knows what but for me I like to I want to know how reality works and it makes me feel every time I get a little bit further along it's like I've I've um, energized my soul or something the deepest parts of me have grown and they feel more spiritualized okay so so it's very very healthy to do this And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. You know, there are these uh, peculiar faculties of the psyche that it isn't entirely confined to, to space and time. Now, these facts be, show that the psyche, in part at least, is not dependent upon these confinements. And then what? When the psyche is not under that obligation to live in time and space alone and obviously it doesn't and uh, that means a, a practical uh, um, continuation of life of a sort of psychical existence uh, beyond time and space only ignorance deny these uh, these facts you know. do you yourself believe that death is probably the end or do you, do you believe that well i i can't say you see, the word belief is a, diff a difficult thing for me. I don't believe. I must have a reason uh, to, for, for a certain hypothesis. Either I know a thing, and when I know it, I don't be need to believe it. If I, I don't allow myself, for instance, to be believe a thing just for the sake of believing it, uh, I, I can't believe it. But when there are sufficient reasons to, for a certain hypothesis, I shall accept these reasons, naturally. Well, now, you told us that we should regard death as being a goal. Yes. And that to shrink away from it is to evade life and yes. evade life purposes. Yes. What advice would you 
give to people in their later life to enable them to do this when most of them must in fact believe that death is the end of everything. Mm -hmm. When he is afraid, when he doesn't look forward, he looks back, he petrifies, he, he, he gets uh, stiff and, and uh, he dies before his time. But when he is living on, looking forward to the great adventure that is ahead, then he lives. And that is about what the unconscious is intending to do. Of course, it's quite obvious that we are all going to, to die, and this is the, the, the sad finale of everything. Um, but nevertheless, there is something in us that doesn't believe it, apparently. But it, this is merely a fact, a psychological fact. For, doesn't mean to me that it proves something. It is simply so. Uh, and I think if you think along the lines of nature, then you think properly.